rock. Jesus is the rock of our salvation. Hosanna. Jesus is the rock. Jesus is the rock of our salvation. Hosanna. Oh, blessed be the rock. Blessed be the rock of our salvation. Hosanna. Blessed be the rock. Sing it again. Blessed y'all a new song tonight it's it's good good david i'm uh, david garen told me about it you know he, he usually comes up with really good ones for an 18 year old is my firm foundation the rock on which i stand when everything around me is shaking I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus. Cause he's never let me down. He's faithful through generations. So why would he fail now? He won't.
presence to cheer and to guide. Strength for today and provide hope for tomorrow. See blessings all mine with ten thousand. y'all to turn and greet one another. Welcome to the Worship and the Word Fellowship. Get scared. I can 
preach about right now after okay. listening to that song. Let me tell you what. God's been faithful to me. I don't know about everybody else, but he's been faithful to me time and time and time again. I want to ask Pastor and Renee if they'll come up here and stand with me just for a second. I'm not going to get long-winded. I don't even know what I'm going to say. It's off the cuff. I actually went online and couldn't find anything. But we we did. We, we missed, I'm embarrassed to say, we missed Pastor Appreciation because it's in the month of October. But we're only one week late. <laughs> but I had a broken finger, so we could... No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But, you know, that's, that's, that's true. But, you know, it's, I, was, I looked for words. I did. I Googled this. And I looked for words. And I'm going to cry because I'm a crier. But I've also been raised in a preacher's home. It's not an easy life, folks. It's not an easy life. You may think it is, and it may look glamorous when they're up here, but it's not. You live in a fishbowl, like Renee said. You do one thing, it's wrong with this group of people. You do this, it's wrong with that group of people. All you can do is keep your eyes on him. But I looked for words to, to describe these two, and I couldn't find anything. They were all too big of words, I couldn't say them. But when I thought about pastor, this is what came to me first, is transparency. Now, that may not be a big, important word to somebody, but it is to me. This man is so transparent with who he is and where he stands with the Lord. He's compassionate. He has a soul for the lost. He loves everybody. He wants everybody to like him. It's not going to happen. It's not, <laughs> it's not going to happen. But I, I, listen, I lived my life that way, so I know what it's like. It's not fun. Get, when you get my age, you get over it a little bit, but not much. But that's the three words that came to me. This lady here, the first word that came to my mind was joy. I have never in my life met anybody that when she stands up, she just exudes joy. And she get listen, I've been in music most all my life except for a lot of years when I had to step down. It's not easy. She stands up here week in and week out like there's five to ten thousand people sitting in this audience. That's not easy to do. I've sung to twenty five and I've sung to thousands, but it's not easy because we feed off of the congregation, don't we? But she never lets it down. I've seen her at work. I've seen her everywhere. I've seen this man everywhere. And let me tell you, they're always the same. They're so consistent in their walk with the Lord. And that means everything to me. I don't know about you all, but we may be small in number, but we have real big hearts here. And we love you guys more than you will ever, ever know. And I want everybody to stand if they would. And I want you to look at the faces, everybody here, because everybody here loves you. And I've asked Wayne, because he's one of the senior board members, if he would come and pray a blessing over you and Renee. Can you come up here, Wayne? We're going to get rid of that walker. I'm about to go see yeah. get rid of. We're going to pray over yeah. that walker to be gone. I'd like everyone to stretch their hands toward Renee and Pastor David. We thank you, God, for this here ministry, Worship and the Word. We ask you to open these doors and let the flocks come in. We just say thank you, thank you, thank you. We are so blessed to have these two as our leaders of our church. And we ask you to cover them with good health and the future is doors are opening. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all so much. That means so much to us. You, uh, you, you all don't need a special day to show appreciation because you do it all the time. You're very good about um, showing your appreciation, and we're grateful for that. We thank you so much for your support. I have never been a part of a group that is more faithful and consistent in coming and being. We know where you are when every time, and so it means a lot to me. And it has been our goal. Since, since the very beginning of our ministry, probably even before that, just to be uh, transparent, to be who we are. I've seen so many ministers, and they're one way at home. 
not that they're sinful or anything, but they let a part of them be seen that really everybody needs to see. You know, it's, it's a matter of if I don't show that I struggle, you think that, well, I just have some kind of special blessing and you'll never get there, you know? When, when people are transparent and they show, thank you so much, honey. I'm going to take the bottle instead. Oh, you did? Okay, thank you. But if people don't see that you struggle, then they, they don't know that there is an answer and they see you struggle through and you're an example to them. We, we were told by our son a few years ago, um, we, we want to see, he wanted to see us work through some things. And our instinct at that time was to say, Darren, leave the room for a minute. We, Mom and I have to talk about some stuff. Well, it was stuff he needed to hear, but we didn't want him to hear because we were afraid it was going to hurt him. But he was so hungry to watch us walk through it because it helps him do the same. And so we're just we're very grateful that the Lord has continued to keep us that way um, because I think it's a, such an important part of ministry. And the fact that you make me cry doesn't help anything. Tenderhearted? Sometimes. That, that part I try to hide with my sarcasm and my jokes. But thank you all so much. We love you very much. And um, God is so good to us. And I hope you realize that. I, I know that this ministry um, is a blessing certainly to us. And I'm hoping it's, I know it's a blessing to you. But the blessing isn't from us. The blessing is from the Lord. And the Lord's presence is the blessing. And that's why it's been my goal and my determination to always get us to him. Get us to him. Because, you know, as, as wonderful as R Renee and David are, <laughs> we can't do anything for you like he can. Amen? All power and glory goes to him, and he's a good God, and he loves you. There's times when this, the enemy will whisper in your ear, ear, does God really even know you exist? You're not, you're not feeling it. You're not seeing it. But let me tell you, my word, the word of God says he loves you. He loves you. He pursues you. His goodness and mercy follows you all the days of your life. If you will walk in the path that he has for you. Amen. So thank you so much. That was very kind of you. And I, I was serious. You guys went so overboard last year. I thought, well, we can, we can ride that for a few years, actually. So thank you for you being lavishly appreciative for us. Thank you. I'm starting a new series. It helps me to be in a series. Because then I don't have to figure out from week to week what I'm going to talk about. <laughs> you know, I kind of know the next verses that are going to come my way. So it's very helpful, and I'm hoping it's helpful for you too, because there's nothing more important in these times that we live in for us to know the word of God. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. We live in a deceptive world full of lies and deception. Let me tell you something. Satan is the ruler of the, the kingdoms of this world. The Bible says that. And Satan is incapable of doing anything but lying. He is the father of lies, the Bible says. He, deception just pours out of him, and he's so good at it, and he's gotten it down to such a great science that it looks like the truth. It looks good. He masquerades as an angel of light. And his servant act like they're servants of light. The Bible says this. And if he were walking around with horns and a pitchfork, you, you kind of would know, I'm going to stay away from that guy. Right? But when he comes to you and he comes to society and he comes and he looks good, he entices us and 
and tempts us and drags us away by our own sinful nature that he still kind of has access to if we let him and he pulls us away and so that's why it's so important to me that we know the word you know the lie because you know the truth so many people even in the church today they're just drinking in the lie because they don't know what the word of God says they don't know what the word of God says they're told by society what God thinks well society doesn't know what God thinks society wants God to think what they think and they try they try to twist it to make it what is supposed to be godly the word of God says that there's a day that comes when good is bad evil and evil is called good well we're there we're there every day I, I just I try and I'm telling you I try not to watch it but it's hard to get away from it because it's it's part of campaign speeches it's part of why we're voting it's you know the things that are happening that um, by the way vote on Tuesday vote for biblical principles things that are right and uh, I that, that's that's the end of my political speech but it <laughs> but it's important it's important that we stand up for truth and righteousness as a church we can't cower back you know they want us to and we're gonna be talking a little bit about that tonight they want us to shut up and they try to silence us cancel culture lack of a freedom of speech shut up you don't agree with me and and what we Christians tend to do when we're in that battle and that fight and we're 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 weary from the battle is just to say well I'll just go home I'll go to church and be around the people that love me and but that's not what God called us to do we're supposed to stand for righteousness we don't have to fight the battle the Lord fights the battle but with our anointing and filled with the Holy Spirit we preach the truth we proclaim the truth of God's Word there's only one way it's Jesus Christ there's only one way everybody thinks there's many ways we'll find out one day won't we but the Bible says every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord and I would rather everybody just learn to do it now than to be forced to do it later when it's too late but that's the truth and how can we not tell people the truth that they are not going to have eternal life that they're on a path to destruction how is that love well you should just agree that my lifestyle is fine and God made me this way well let me tell you something you're on a pathway to destruction and I love you enough to tell you if you're walking on the edge of a cliff I want to say watch out you're gonna fall you're gonna perish but God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life God knows who you are God knows what you struggle with God knows the sin that so easily besets us he loves us anyway if we just turn to him and receive the gift of eternal he's not asking us to do anything but just accept and believe him amen that's not even really part of the series that's just a freebie you can pay for it if you want to but that's just a freebie so the glorious calling first and second Peter you know who Peter is Peter was a, a beloved apostle of Jesus Christ he um, he was the one that made the first confession that thou art the Christ the son of the living God and Jesus said to him Peter you are a rock and on this rock not Peter but the rock of his confession that thou art the Christ I will build my church and guess what the gates of hell will not prevail against it oh they try they try but they're not gonna prevail against it it's God's church and he's only going to tolerate people coming at it so long he's only going to tolerate that so long and the gates of hell will not prevail against it it's also Peter that said I will never deny you and then what did he do denied him three times and what did Christ do at resurrection restored him 
When we sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He knows in ourselves we're weak, but in our weakness, he is strong. So that's who Peter was. He was a loudmouth fisherman. He often said things he shouldn't say. He was not educated like some of the other guys. And, um, but that's okay. And on the day of Pentecost, he delivered the first Christian message. The, he preached the first Christian sermon on the day of Pentecost. Imagine going from a denying Christ just a few weeks earlier to being the first one to be able to reach 3,000 people that came because of that sermon. That's a pretty good thing, huh? And 3,000 came into the church that day. So before we get into the actual text of Peter, I want to talk a little bit about the Bible, the Word of God. This is why this is so important for us to realize the importance of the the Bible and the Word of God. Did you know it's still the best-selling book? They don't even bother saying it because it's millions and millions every year. And I also saw this week that it's also the most stolen. I'm not sure what that means. Hotels? Is that what it is? The poor Gideons. Oh, man, but that's all right. If you're going to take something from the hotel, the Bible will be better than a towel. All right? It was written over. Now, this is what is so unique, and you have to get this. This is what's unique about the Bible that is not, cannot be said of any other book, any other text, by any other religion. It was written more over 1,500 years with by more than 40 authors written on three continents. Now, originally, it wasn't the Bible that we know today. It was each individual book, and it stood, each book stood on its own. So when they would go to the temple and they would read the scriptures, they would take the scroll of Isaiah and read it. They didn't turn with me to Isaiah in your Bibles. It wasn't like that. But um, there was no agreed-upon compilation of the Bible until the 5th century A.D. That's when they finally put it all together. And you know what happened when they put it all together? It agrees with itself. After 1,500 years of writing and after 40 authors over three continents, it agrees. It comes together. It agrees, and there are themes that are consistent That is incredible when you think about it because that shows that it's the inspired word of God that the Holy Spirit uh, inspired these writers to write because the Holy Spirit has the truth and they got it on paper. Thank God. You know, Job didn't have the Psalms. Job didn't have the Psalms to go to. Thank God we do. When we go through trouble and trials, we get to the word of God. But too often we just leave it on the desk. And we don't get into it, and it's so valuable to us. Now, the, um, uh, there's others like the Quran. The Quran was written by one man over one week or two, uh, one month, and he received um, these, this uh, word from one prophet, and he can't, they can't even confirm that that's where it came from. The Bible is archaeologically confirmed. The places that are mentioned in the Bible are still there today. So there's no, we can, we can actually substantiate the word of God by what we see in reality today in the Bible. And uh, I think it was Joseph Smith. He was visited by the angel, what's the angel, Mor- Mor- Mordecai or whatever, Mormon. Same thing. He was given, he was given plates that he, he wrote down the Book of Mormon, and then the plates were taken back by the angel. So there's no way to confirm that there was even plates to begin with, and it was written by one man. And it has no power, no life, as opposed to what the Lord has given us with the Word of God. The Word of God is living and active, and it's powerful. You want answers to your questions? Get to the Word. Know the word. Study to show yourself approved. I have hidden your word in my heart, Lord, that I might not sin against thee. How do you keep from temptation? You know the word. You know the word. So the New Testament now consistently deals with sufferings, trials, and persecution. Okay? 
when we're now, we went, really the Old Testament too, the Lord's people have suffered over the centuries since the beginning. But there is something new about the new covenant with Jesus Christ that the, the James and Peter and John and Paul wanted to tell these early Christians that expect suffering, expect trials, and we're going to find out why. They're promised. They're promised to us. God uses these as tools to build and test our faith. I don't understand that, but I get it because I know when I'm not going through a trial, I'm not growing. When I'm walking around blessed and happy, I don't grow there. I grow through the trial. You want it. I've used this term, this theme many times. You want to build muscle? You go and lift weight. You have resistance training. That's the only way you're going to build muscle. You think you can build it by sitting on the couch and watching TV. And wouldn't that be better? But that's not how it works. You want to be strong physically? You have to have resistance. You want to be strong spiritually? It's just the economy of spirituality. We'll understand it better by and by. Right? So... First Peter, beginning with verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. Praise to God for a living hope. How many know we always have to keep the hope, keep hope alive, the living hope that Christ, Christ provides for us. Now, these that he's writing to, they were scattered. It's believed that they were there on the day of Pentecost. They were there that came to be believers because of his sermon and then they went back to the places. Remember, each one heard in their own language from their own place the, the gospel being preached when they, when they were given the utterance by the Holy Spirit. So now they're be the, these believers in Jesus Christ were now sent back to pagan countries. There was no church that they could run to, to a pastor, and now grow in the Lord. So this is why Peter felt the need to write to them and encourage them. And the Bible says that in Acts, in, it says in, in Acts that the, the people sat under the apostles' teaching. Why? Because the apostles sat under Jesus' teaching. We only have four gospels, but he was teaching and preaching for three years. John says, if everything was written down that he ever did or said, the world could not contain the volumes of it. So these apostles had firsthand understanding, and that's why it was important for the new believers to sit under their teaching. We still today need to be taught, 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 taught. We got to be. Uh, we have to be in it ourselves, but we also need to sit under teaching. It's very important for us. Uh, my, my great aunt, I've told you all this story, not, not everybody, my great aunt, she was about 80 some years old, we went to visit her in Michigan, and um, Christian all her life, church all the time, um, but she was, she was pretty much too old to be going to church, they'd take her in a wheelchair every once in a while, but we came to visit her, and she's sitting in her living room, her Bible open on her lap, watching Christian television, watching preachers, watching teachers, and, you know, just praising God. And we came in, and I'm like, Aunt Becky, haven't you heard it all? Come on, you're 80-something years old. You've been doing this your whole life. Is there anything new that you can learn? And she said, I like to feast on the word. I like to feast. This is our daily bread, our ver the very word spoken to us. Our daily bread. You can't live a good, strong, healthy life if you're only eating bread on Sunday. Right? It doesn't work that way. You're anemic. You're anemic. I was so glad Darren came home because 
he hadn't been eating right. He got down with his fever, and then he started eating, and we started making all his favorite foods, and he was just taking it all. I bought him a box of cinnamon toast crunch, and he had it empty by the time the next morning came. So, but that's so important for physical health, but sp you can't reject that spiritually, the daily bread. And then the air that we breathe is his spirit. We have to operate in the spirit even when we're under the word because this Holy Spirit was sent to guide us into the truth. He's the author of the Bible. He knows what it means. And all we have to do is ask him, Holy Spirit, tell me what this means. Oh, it's so confusing. It's so confusing, Pastor. I just don't get it. Talk to the Holy Spirit. He's the author. He will be happy to do what he's supposed to do. Guide you into all truth. Amen? Amen. All right. So they, they were now back in pagan countries. They didn't have the Bible. They didn't have any kind of support. So they were being instructed now by Peter how to handle the fact that they're believers in Jesus Christ, but in an environment, in a country that opposes their new beliefs. I wonder how that feels. I wonder how that feels. Oh, it feels just like we are. So Peter is trying to instruct them on how to live, be in the world, but not of it. They are strangers and aliens now. Once you accept Jesus Christ, you're not part of this kingdom anymore. You're a part of a kingdom that is not seen. And so it's, we have to figure out how to live in that kingdom while still being strangers and aliens on this earth. So Peter reminds them, first of all, of who they are. He, he, they, they had the chance to hear the gospel on the day of Pentecost, but now he reminds them. Verse 3, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. I love that. It's too, too easy for us to say God and not follow up with the Lord Jesus Christ because it's not just thank God. It's thank God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. Look at those words again. An inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. Keep that in mind when things get bad here, that that stuff, it will never spoil, will never fade, and it will never perish. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to re be revealed in the last time. In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may, be ha you may have to suffer grief and all kinds of trials. I thought this was a note of encouragement, but no, this, this is the truth. For a little while... Keep in mind, a little while, a brief time. The Bible says our lives are like a vapor. Our, the grass withers and the flowers fade. The word of God lives forever. So keep in mind, these are light and temporary trials. They may seem overwhelming, but they cannot compare to the glory that is waiting for us in heaven. Keep in mind that. That's where the kingdom is. Who through faith, I'm sorry, where am I? Uh, seven, these have come so that the, pr the proven genuineness of your faith, another version says that your faith would be proven genuine. It's important. That's important. The trials and trouble come so that your faith is proven genuine. Not only to God, but to yourself, that you have a firm foundation in your faith. And the Bible says that we go through the fire and come out as pure gold. Look at this. Your pr proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, 
which perishes even though refined by fire may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you did not, do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. That's where joy comes from. That's where the joy comes from. Happiness comes and goes. But that joy comes from knowing Jesus and you are believing in him. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Peter's reminding what, what Jesus said to Thomas. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. This is what's so important for us in this day that we live in. We are walking by faith, not by sight. Because we can't see this kingdom, but the word of God says it exists. So how do you believe it? You have faith that the word of God is true. Verse 10, concerning the salvations, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you searched intently and with the greatest care, trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the spirit of Christ in them, the spirit of Christ in them, re realize this. This is the Old Testament, he's saying. The Old Testament prophets trying to find the time and circumstances to which the spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories that would follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you when they spoke of the things that have now been told, told you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Even angels long to look into these things. Now, let me just unpack what he just said. He just defined what I said earlier about the unity of the themes of scripture, the prophets of the Old Testament pointed to Jesus and the preachers of the New Testament pointed to Jesus. The theme throughout the ages has been there's a Messiah that is prophesied. It's very specific for unto you in Isaiah, for unto you a child is born, unto you a son is given. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Prince of Peace, a virgin will give birth. That's the Old Testament prophecies. Then what happens in the New Testament? For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. A virgin shall conceive and have the Messiah. And then the, the men of the, uh, the Jewish nation then were like, well, this can't be it. This isn't. We, we've got hierarchy now. It can't be some lowly baby born in a manger. In the city of Bethlehem, what is that? He's got to be a ruler. And so they couldn't accept it. And that's what the, the message also from other, these other guys were. But then the New Testament points to Jesus in the back, in the past, and then turns around in Revelation and other places and says, he's coming back. He's coming back. I've gone to prepare a place for you. That where I am, you shall be also. If God fulfilled the prophecies all the way through, why won't he fulfill the prophecies now? There's coming a day. It could be any day, by the way. This is why it's so important for us to be ready. I don't care what you, how you were brought up. I don't care. You better cover the base. You better say, Jesus, if you're real, if this is real, I want you because I know I want to go and be where you are. And that's, why not? What have you got to lose? What have you got to lose? Nothing or everything. So believe it. Therefore, verse 13, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. As obedient children, do not conform, you've heard this in other places, to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. So Paul's message to them was to protect them 
from the pagans that throughout history have tried to incorporate their ways into Christianity. That's fine. Believe in Jesus. But here, let's just add a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And, and all of a sudden, Jesus isn't Lord. And it, it was worthless for him to come and die on the cross. Well, that's what he's warning them. He's saying, you're going to have to be holy now. You're going to let the Holy Spirit do not conform to the pattern you see. It's so easy to see something and say, well, that looks right to me. Let's build a statue. I'm, I'm worshiping Jesus, but it's a statue of Jesus. Maybe it's the stations of the cross. Maybe it's the crucifix. No, we don't see with our eyes what we worship. Why would I worship something that was made by man when I can worship the one who made man? Keep that in your mind. But the world doesn't like that. They want to see it before they believe it. Right? So, the result of obedience, then, is the development of holiness in our lives. And this is the point of the sufferings and the trials. Now, what are, tri I was thinking about this, what are trials and sufferings? Some of us call trials and sufferings stuff that's really not trials and sufferings. You know, I was mad at a lady for um, trying to wiggle her way around me on military trail this afternoon. I was, and I, then I said, God bless her. That's a big step for me. It's a big step for me. That's not a trial. That's not suffering. That's a test. That was a test of my faith. Okay? Trials and suffering, first of all, they result, they're a result of living in a fallen world. We're living among pagans. We're living in a sinful culture. Not only that, but we are experiencing pain sorrow, conflict, and ultimately death. We have sickness. That's suffering. That's the pain of suffering and the trials that we have to let the Lord help us to develop our faith in those times. But what we want to do is whine about it. God doesn't love me. I wouldn't have to go through this. Yes, you have to go through this because God does love you. And he wants to accomplish a work to strengthen your faith so that you will not be standing firm in your faith. The second thing is perhaps it's the result of our poor choices. You drive reckless, you might get in a car accident. You make poor health choices. There's a box of donuts back there, by the way, if anybody wants it. You make poor health choices, you pay the consequences of that, and you suffer through that. We need to put in, uh, God disciplines in those situations. God chastens and disciplines those he loves. So sometimes he sends sickness to remind us that uh, you're not going the way you're supposed to go. You need to get back on track. We must follow God's word and avoid anything that removes us from his protection. Live healthy, live strong, and you'll s and stay near the word of God and obey. Num number three, we suffer at the hands of the devil and his minions. <sighs> He's a roaring lion. Genesis says, sin is crouching at your door. You must, you must take charge over it. The enemy comes, the thief comes to steal kill and destroy he has been given the ability to roam about the earth to find someone to devour right look at job job was allowed uh now let me tell you this the, the caveat is is satan can't do anything on his own unless the lord allows it and job is proof of that too many times we say well this is just satan well yeah but there's a reason the Lord allowed it to happen. He can't touch you unless the Lord has a program through it, a process for you to go through it. Job is an example of that. The woman bound by Satan for 18 years when Jesus healed her, 
bound by Satan for 18 years. Paul said he had a thorn in his flesh that was a messenger of Satan. We don't know what that was, but we, we believe that it was a, 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 a thought, a, a cap, had to capture a thought, whether it was a negative thought, whether it was a, a sinful temptation, but it, he said it was a messenger of Satan. And what did God say? And we're going to talk about this, but my grace is sufficient for you. You're going to be fine. I'm, going to not, I'm not going to take it away. Because why? It keeps you on your toes, Paul. It keeps you on your toes. It keeps you praying. The sin that so easily besets us, the temptation, sexual temptation, heterosexual temptation, homosexual temptation, those are all trials. Those are all at the hand of the enemy, and they come at us, and he exacerbates it. He energizes it. And we have to learn how to fight that. And the Lord allows us to go through that so that we learn how to resist him and fight that. I've seen, I've seen men and women that just struggle every day with a, a temptation, sexual addiction, a, a desire for sex, a desire for ungodly things. That's the sinful nature. That's something that is part of our sinful nature. It's called the lusts of the flesh. I know many people that have struggled with homosexuality for years and years and years. And I praise God, many of them pray through and they overcome day to day. But some give up. You don't give up when you go through these sufferings and you go through these trials and these temptations. You just keep on keeping on because in the testing of your faith, you're developing perseverance. If you give up, you don't develop perseverance. You've given up perseverance. You develop perseverance so that you may be mature and complete. It doesn't happen overnight. It's, an, it's maybe a lifelong process, but you don't give up because it develops in you something that is good. Number four, God uses our suffering to accomplish his purpose. Not only in refining us and giving us a stronger faith, but in accomplishing what he wants to do. Look at how he used the sufferings of Joseph at the hands of his brothers, selling him into slavery, telling their father that he was dead, and having him to go through 13 years of being in prison. And God had given him a vision of what and what ended up happening at the end of that. Joseph was able to save his people from starvation. That was God's plan all along. But Joseph had to go through the trials and the suffering to get to that point. That's the iPad. I guess they're playing the music, so it's time to close, right? Joseph had to do that. The ultimate example of this is the suffering of Christ, the crucifixion. God used hateful, sinful, rebellious people to get him on the cross. God used one of his own disciples to betray him. He used the religious leaders in their sinful condition to condemn him. And he used uh, people. The guy was innocent. But you don't send an innocent person to the cross that was prophesied about to save the world from sin. He's not going to jump up there on his own and say, just nail me in. Right? But because they did that, what does Jesus say on the cross? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. But God used that suffering to get us saved, to give us salvation. He may want to do that through our lives. I heard a story of a of a guy who he, he had a burden and a passion to go and minister to the drug cartels of uh, Colombia. And he was going to go there. He flew in. He was going to go find them in their camps and, and try to reach them for Christ because he had such a burden to win them to Christ. Soon as he got there, he was falsely accused of stuff, and they threw him in prison. And he was in prison for years and years and years. Guess who joined him in prison? The drug cartels. 
he didn't have to go there, but God used the suffering of the chains to make his word accomplished. Same thing with Paul. I thank God for my chains because when I'm in chains, I'm writing you letters that we're still reading and studying today. I further the gospel in the chains. We don't want that, do we? Our sinful nature doesn't want that. Can't you work it out so it works out for me and you, God? No. No. I'll go where you want me to go, dear Lord. Remember that song? Or mountain or plain or sea. I'll do what you want me to do, dear Lord. That's not right. I'll say. Say what you want me to say, dear Lord. I'll be who you want me to be. Oh, no. No, no. I, I'll, I'll give him a list. Lord, this is what I want to be. This is what I want to do. This is where I want to go. And this is where I want to go to eat. So do this. No, it's not how it works. It's not how it works. So what we do in those times of suffering, we put on the full armor of God. Put on the full armor of God. The shield of faith that blocks the fiery darts of Satan. How many of the fiery darts are blocked? All of them. No weapon formed against me will prosper, but I got to have the shield of faith up. I can't just stand there unguarded. We, we resist the devil. How do you resist the devil? He comes, I, I, the thoughts, the thoughts that are negative, and I, ask, I have to ask myself, hmm, where did that thought come from? That doesn't sound like a godly thought. That sounds like a satanic thought. I think I'll resist that and go with this. That's how you do it. It takes discipline. It takes disciplining our mind. It's taking down and casting down vain imaginations. We got to pray. We got to pray and then pray again and pray some more. The Bible says pray without ceasing. Why? Because without it, we're not going to see God accomplish. He wants us to come to him and say, God, help me. Help me with this. You promised that you would help me. You promised that you would help. If I come to you, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run in and are saved. They don't stay where they are and say, boy, I wish I could get in that tower. No, they run into it and they're saved. Resolve to persevere faithfully in his strength. You just make a decision. I'm not going back to where I was. I'm going forward. I'm persevering. I don't care what the enemy throws at me. I don't care what this world throws at me. They got nothing on my God. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And I'm going to step forward fearless. Though they take me, they kill my body, they won't have my soul. And my soul is more valuable than pure gold. Amen? So... Verse 17, we'll wrap this up. Since you call on, I, it just was important for us to identify what trials and tests and sufferings are. You know, I, I, I didn't get the right Egg McMuffin the other day, and I kind of thought it was a suffering, you know, but that's not what it is. And listen, I'm, I warn you from the scripture because I agree, I'm agreeing with Jesus and the prophecies of the disciples in their books. It's going to get worse. It's going to get worse. Jesus says in Matthew 24, there's going to come a day when they're going to come in here and bind us and take us off to prison. It's going to happen. So isn't it a good idea to get strong in our faith before it gets really, really bad? It'll be a lot harder to grow in your faith when you're being dragged off, right? So since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear for you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors but with the precious blood of Christ a lamb without blemish or defect he did not 
think, consider glory to be something to be obtained, but to reject it, to humble himself as the spotless lamb to come and redeem us. And he shed his precious blood. What does precious mean? Valuable. Valuable. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him, you believe in God who raised him from the dead and glorified him. And so you put your faith and hope are in God. God has given us everything we need to overcome. God is, he's, he's acquainted. The Bible says he's acquainted with our suffering. Jesus was tempted in all ways that we are, yet he did not sin. He was acquainted with our suffering. He was uh, wounded and bruised for our iniquities. He, uh, God is involved in our suffering. He limits the suffering to no more than we can handle. I will not do it more than you can bear. Some days it feels like more than you can bear. That's when you pray. That's when you get, you seek the Lord. That's when you put the armor of God on. Because when you're, when you're feeling that vulnerability, read the word. The word says, I will not, it's not going to be more than you can bear. His promises, he promises it will work out for good. All things work together for good. Things that you would never think could be good, God miraculously will work out for your good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Remember, we said this from the very beginning, he cares deeply for you. Jesus knows all about our trouble. Come up, we're going to sing that, right? Which one are we singing? You did, okay. Well then, that little cue was worthless. Always turn to God in prayer. Expect his grace, his grace that is sufficient for you. But you got to ask. You got to say, Lord, give me that. In all of your anxiety, you come to the Lord with thanksgiving and prayer and supplications. And the peace of God, which passes understanding, will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Blessed is the man who has his eyes and heart fixed on the Lord. He will keep him in perfect peace. Read the word. When you're feeling like you need comfort, read a psalm. I did that this morning. I broke, I cracked open a couple of psalms and I'm like, oh, I'm encouraged. Mm -hmm. The Lord loves me. He's powerful. Remember, there is coming a day when there will be no more pain. There will be no more suffering. There will be no more tears. It's coming. Yes, it is. It's promised. Yes. God will wipe away all tears from our eyes. We will never die again. We will never be sick again. We will never deal with COVID again. We will never deal with the flu again. We will never age again. Hallelujah. I I'm sorry. I looked right at you when I said that. <laughs> I just figured you'd be happy about that. that isn't that fantastic? It's a promise of God's word. Yes, it is. I'm telling you, this is what God says. I didn't say it. He said. And now in verse 22, now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. Now, when we are obedient to the Lord, love is the result. Jesus said, here's your two commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. And oh, by the way, love your enemies. Love those who persecute you. Do not curse. Do not overcome evil with evil, but overcome evil with good. It's, it's what Christ did. It's what Christ did. He never cursed someone out. He said, Father, forgive them. Bless them. Help them. Verse 23, that's what being Christ-like is about. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. For all people are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. What I'm telling you, the word of God says, is solid. 
You take it to the bank, you're going to take it to heaven. It will never change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And like he blessed Job with twice as much as he had before, we're going to get millions of times what we had before because God is preparing a place for us. Amen. So we want to take advantage of this, the troubles that we go through. Don't whine. Don't complain. Don't blame everybody else. Just say, Lord, what do you got? What are we working on today? How are you developing my faith? Am I cursing this trouble? Am I cursing this problem and saying this isn't of God? Or am I believing your word saying, in this world you have, will have trouble, but be of good cheer. Oh, well, I'm not doing so good today. That's not good cheer. Be of good cheer. Why? Because he has overcome the world. He's already conquered it, and he's making us more than conquerors. Let's sing it. I need thee, oh, I need thee, every hour, every hour. something. Please. pastor had asked me to sing another song. I usually obey my pastor. But as That's sure fine. as I'm sitting on this bench, the Holy Spirit told me to sing this song. There's somebody in this building tonight, and I don't know who you are. I don't need to know who you are. But you need the Lord. And if you'll turn your lives and all your issues over to Him, nothing Nothing is impossible. Stand with me and let's sing this. It's so simple. I need thee. true what Brenda's saying. Jesus has paid the price for all of us who have fallen short of the glory of God. That's what Romans says. No one is righteous. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. There's nothing we can do in ourselves to have salvation. And God knew that. So God did it for us. And it's a gift. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. You handed me a gift tonight, and I could just stand up and say, well, that's nice, but what do I got to do? Take it. All I have to do is take it. 
receive it. That's right. He's not asking you to do anything else but just take it. No. Oh, if someone gives you a Christmas gift, a birthday gift, you say, oh, no, 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 I don't deserve that. No, you don't deserve it. But here, it's a gift. Take it. All you say, Jesus, I'm a sinner. I recognize that you have provided me a gift of salvation and eternal life. Your word says that I've fallen short, but you've made up the difference. And when I accept you into my life, you cover me with righteousness so that the Father sees you and not my sin. And you give me, you, you traded my sin. You took my sin on the cross so that I could receive your righteousness. So, Lord, we receive tonight. We all do. Whether we've done it for the first time tonight or if this is a time when we just want to reaffirm right. our commitment to Jesus Christ as our Savior and Lord. Lord, we really we stand here believing that there's nothing we can lose by accepting that free gift of salvation and eternal life. So we do. We ask you to come into our hearts. We ask you to send your spirit into our lives now so that we can overcome sin and bring pleasure to our God and be pleasing in his sight. And Lord, I pray for those that are struggling with trials and sufferings and problems. I pray that this word tonight has brought encouragement to them, that they would feel empowered by your spirit now and be actively growing in our faith. Lord, let us not become weary in well-doing, but Lord, let us encourage each other and spur each other on to victory and run the race together. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You want to sing it one more time? I need thee, oh, oh just hold up a hand and look I to heaven. I need thee. tonight we have a facebook message us messenger us um, my phone number renee's phone number is on our facebook page text us let us know and we want to agree with you in prayer we don't want to just send you out that's what we're supposed to do bear one another's burdens help when someone is overburdened i take a little load off of you and when i'm overburdened you help me right that's what the word of god says and encourage one another so God bless you all. Thank you so much for being here tonight. And I pray that the word of God would do and accomplish what he wants it to do in our lives. And it's all good. It's all good. Thank you for being here. God bless you as you go. Turn to someone next to you and say, you look good tonight. You look real good tonight. <laughs>